The Shadows of Paris Written by Cyprian Jossen Chapter 1 A New Life Ifeoma stood near the Eiffel Tower, contemplating its majestic silhouette as the evening lights illuminated the Parisian sky. Memories of her fiancé, Aikyo Kike, surged back, like melancholic echoes of the night when she was about to embark on her journey to Europe through Libya, guided by migrant smugglers. The lights of the City of Light echoed the sweetness of Aikyo Kike's voice, a voice that still resonated in her mind like a distant melody. The romance, born on the lively streets of the village of Amekuku Aweri, had traversed oceans and borders to find itself here, under the watchful eye of the Iron Lady. Aikyo Kike, the young man with eyes imbued with wisdom from the city of Aweri in Nigeria, had captured Ifeoma's heart. His promises of a better future for her were spoken with the passion of a poet. Shared laughter and dreams woven in the shadow of challenges to come had forged an unbreakable bond between them, making her stronger in Paris. However, the brutal reality of exile subjected them to unexpected trials. The journey through Libya, guided by the hope of a new life, had left indelible scars on their love story. Warm embraces and whispered promises in the darkness of refugee camps had been carried away by the winds of uncertainty. That night, as Ifeoma stood alone under the benevolent gaze of the Eiffel Tower, she wondered what would become of their shared dreams. The lights of Paris danced, but in the corners of her heart, she bore the burden of difficult choices and divergent paths. Aikyo Kike's thoughts, left behind, vibrated like a melancholic melody, recalling the time when their love was a blazing fire, burning to the rhythm of hope and youth. The echoes of this lost romance blended with the nocturnal symphony of Paris, creating a poignant tableau of memories erased by time and vast distances. Before the journey to Europe, the two lovers would meet behind the mango tree, their usual hidden meeting place, away from the village's watchful eyes. Village gossip hinted that Ifeoma was an easy girl, and the busybody people circulated false stories about their future and journey to Europe. Ifeoma, look into my eyes, and tell me you'll be faithful when you cross the border, Aikyo Kike pleaded. Never, my love. You are my life, she assured him. Take this money. I exchanged nairas for dollars for you. I sold the family land to help you on your journey. People who have successfully crossed Libya say you have to pay the smugglers along the way. I will pray for you. When you settle, it will be my turn to join you, explained Aikyo Kike. I, you are the sweetest thing I've ever encountered in my life. I want to Joppa for a better life for us and our children. I will wake up in the morning with your image in my heart. No man can take your place. I swear on my mother's life. As she snapped out of her reverie, the imposing structure, adorned with a cascade of lights, seemed to have projected Aikyo Kike's image before her. She longed for his touch, the whispers of his romantic poems that cradled her after their moments together. Aikyo Kike had been her world since their primary school days, and as adults, their friendship had blossomed into a pure love. The illusion of seeing him in her mind's eye in the center of Paris eluded her. Now, the grandeur of the Eiffel Tower contrasted sharply with the arduous journey that brought her to this enchanting city. She viewed the iconic monument not just as a symbol of France, but as a benevolent spirit, much like herself, an immigrant who traversed the Libyan desert to make it to the heart of Paris where she had come to seek political asylum. A few weeks later, she took the complicated Paris metro to Spada, the initial reception office for asylum seekers in Paris. The association assisted her in scheduling an appointment at the Asylum Application Service Center called Gouda, Guichet Unique de Demande d'Asile, where she met immigration agents to recount her journey from Nigeria to Libya, Italy, and France. The perilous desert crossing haunted Ifeoma's thoughts as she was handed a white sheet of paper to document why she sought political refuge in France. Her story began with the relentless heat of the sun bearing down on the vast, desolate landscape, where she and her fellow travelers battled the hostile environment. The wind carried swirling sands that buffeted their lorry, threatening to engulf them in a suffocating embrace. The scorching sun beat down mercilessly creating an oppressive atmosphere where survival was a constant struggle, the value of life became meaningless. In the vast expanse of the desert, the journey was fraught with danger. The scarcity of water became a cruel punishment, 
leaving parched throats and weary bodies in its wake. Weaker travelers succumbed to the harsh conditions, their dreams of a new life extinguished in the unforgiving wilderness. Some were forced to make the ultimate sacrifice, their lives ending tragically and often leaving behind the silent echoes of infants who had never known a life beyond desolation. Ifeoma vividly recalled the moments when human life seemed to have no value in that wild, inhospitable place. Yet, she pressed on, strengthened by the voice of Okiakike that rekindled her soul and the hope of reaching Europe. The memories of the journey lingered, serving as a poignant reminder of the resilience required to overcome the challenges of the desert. The immigration officer returned after reading Ifeoma's story, pointing out that she did not address the question of why she left Nigeria as a political refugee. Instead, her statement reflected the familiar narrative of Africans fleeing their countries as economic refugees. Now, standing beneath the radiant glow of the Eiffel Tower, Ifeoma was seized by panic because of her mistake. Instead of providing a simple answer, she had written off point and may face deportation. She could also file an appeal as a last resort. What will Ikeo Kike tell me? she asked herself. The job at Siva de Frique, Taste of Africa restaurant, where she served as a waitress and dishwasher, held great significance for her. Each day, as she moved around the tables and washed dishes, she could feel the heavy responsibility on her shoulders. The job became more than just a means of making ends meet, it became a lifeline connecting her to her family back in Nigeria, where economic struggles, rampant inflation, and persistent insecurity cast a shadow over their lives. The frequent electricity cuts added to their challenges, making everyday life an uphill battle. Contacting Ifeoma was no easy task either. The scarcity of telephone data meant infrequent calls, and even when they managed to connect, the unreliable network often disrupted their conversations. The stressful life in Nigeria felt like living in hell. She broke down when Ikeo Kike saddled her with the news of how her father, Onika Ugwu, sold all the family land and lavished the money on marrying new wives. Her mother had no more land where she could farm, and when she confronted Onika, the man just beat her up until the villagers came to her help. Her father married six women with twenty-one children before she left the country. With the new wives, their compound would grow to a small village for a man who was a drunkard and depended on his wives to feed him while he sat at home idle with the other men like him who spent their time gossiping all day. The burden on Ifeoma's shoulders went beyond the emotional strain of communicating from afar. Her hard-earned money served as the only hope for her family, offering a potential solution to their myriad problems. School fees for her younger siblings, five of them from her mother's side, teenagers who had been forced to leave school due to financial problems, were now within reach. Ifeoma's earnings became their bread and butter, a source of support against the economic odds stacked against her family. She disliked her father intensely and refused to send him money. My father is a pig, she once told Ike in frustration. Surviving and thriving in Paris wasn't merely about managing her job, it meant going through a cross-cultural shock, unknown to her before, differences, and familial expectations. Upon arrival in France, Ifeoma encountered loneliness, the cold winter, the challenge of using the French metro transportation system, and the reality of living in France as a black woman. However, the issue of racism didn't bother her too much, considering that Nigeria, with its diverse ethnic groups, also experiences discrimination among its people. Everywhere you go, some people don't like others. Additionally, she had to master the French language and adapt to the French lifestyle to integrate into society. Her apartment, situated near the Parmentier metro station in the 11th arrondissement of Paris, was what the French referred to as La Chambre de Bon, a small room on the sixth floor, accessible by creaking wooden steps that meandered up to the corridor leading to her home. At the end of the corridor were the toilet and bathroom facilities. Mama d'Amour, her Cameroonian boss, played a crucial role in securing this place for her. This is your room. Never bring anybody here, Mama d'Amour cautioned her. I'm grateful, Ma, Ifeoma expressed her thanks. In the heart of Paris, Ifeoma's apartment was a humble and modest space, situated high above the bustling streets. The wooden steps, though worn, echoed with the charm of the city. The room, though small, exuded a unique Parisian allure, a blend of simplicity and character. 
From her window, Ifeoma could catch glimpses of the vibrant city below, its energy pulsating through the narrow streets and lively Saturday markets in an open space. She observed cars adhering to traffic signals, a stark contrast to her experiences in Lagos while living with her uncle, Matthias, a trader in the Alaba market. She recounted how chaos ensued in Lagos, especially after the destruction of Igbo properties by the Lagos state government. Matthias shared his frustration, attributing the disorder to the educated illiterates ruling Nigeria who manipulated elections, engaged in violence, and disregarded traffic rules. Nigerians, big or small, lacked respect for red lights. From her Parisian window, Ifeoma admired the organized French society, yearning to bring a piece of its orderliness, to confront the uneducated people and wicked politicians, causing chaos on Nigerian streets. She mused, I'm lucky to be in Paris. I will do my best to make it in this country. The clean environment, consistent electricity, good water supply, and reliable internet reinforced her determination to succeed in the organized and beautiful city of Paris. The Taste of Africa restaurant, Siva d'Afrique, where she toiled from Monday to Sunday, brimmed with liveliness, filled with the enticing aroma of flavorful spices and the distant beats of music. It was a demanding job, requiring her to flash a smile at clients and swiftly serve them, moving from the bustling kitchen to reach different tables. Even when she felt tired, she tried to pull herself together and keep a happy attitude. The restaurant was buzzing with activity, a place where various lives and cultures came together, Africans, French, Americans, and tourists, forming a mosaic like the patterns on a unique Ankara fabric. Ifeoma's dark skin and Afro hair glowed warmly under the restaurant's lights. She moved smoothly between tables, almost dancing, serving dishes that brought the flavors of her home in Nigeria. The sounds of utensils clinking and people laughing, some familiar faces, and other strangers, filled the air in this Parisian spot that celebrated African cuisine. Ifeoma brought a big plate of Nigerian fried rice, juicy chicken, and perfectly fried plantains to a group of curious customers gathered around a large dining table. The delicious smell alone took them on a mental journey to Nigeria, where they imagined a culinary experience even more delightful than French cuisine. In the restaurant, a stranger looked at her. His eyes were deep and mysterious, expressing desire without words. They exchanged glances and feelings that made her sense warmth and tenderness between her legs. Bon appétit, tout le monde, enjoy your meal, everyone, she told her clients, her accent blending English and French. While people chatted and laughed, the stranger stayed quiet, watching Ifeoma without saying much. She kept moving between tables, sometimes looking back at him. It felt like something was pulling them together in this lively mix of cultures and foods. She couldn't explain this attraction. As the evening went on, Ifeoma couldn't stop thinking about the endearing man in his fifties, his mysterious charm and the secrets his eyes hid. Amid the delightful scent of spices and the rhythmic beats of Afrobeat music, the Parisian night whispered secrets of longing and desire. Paris, my Paris, she whispered. As the atmosphere buzzed with unspoken feelings, Adelaide, also known as Mama d'Amour, the Cameroonian woman in charge of the restaurant, observed everything closely. Without Ifeoma's knowledge, Mama d'Amour kept a keen eye on her every action, particularly her special attention to a white man who had given her his business card. His name was Monsieur Guillaume de la Chase, the embodiment of a French lover. He sat there, surrounding Ifeoma with the warmth of his affection. Ifeoma, my dear, come over here. I want to talk to you, Mama d'Amour said. Yes, Mama d'Amour. I've been watching you, serving these dishes like a queen in her palace. You have a grace about you, and the customers love it. Thank you, Mama d'Amour. I'm just trying to do my best. You're doing more than your best, dear, but there's something I need to tell you. This world, especially in a place like Paris, can be a tricky one. Men can be charming, but not all of them have good intentions. I understand, Mama d'Amour. Good, good. Now, I've seen a few of those men giving you that look, the kind that says more than words ever could. I want you to be careful, Ifeoma. I appreciate your concern, Mama Damore. I can handle myself. I know you can, Ifeoma. 
but listen carefully. Don't fall for sweet words that might sour later. Mama d'amour, I promise you, I won't let anyone take advantage of me. I'm here to work and make a living. That's my girl. I've seen too many young women get tangled in the webs of false promises. This place is a family, and I won't stand for anyone disturbing the harmony. You can trust me, Mama d'amour. I won't let anything or anyone disrupt the peace we have here. I'm sure you won't, I feel ma. Now, get back to your work and continue creating the magic you do in the kitchen. Just remember, if anyone misbehaves, they'll have to deal with Mama Damore, I feel ma smiling said, I appreciate your wisdom, Mama Damore. Papa God will bless you. You Nigerians, always calling your Papa God. Why? Mama Damor was born into a wealthy royal family. Her given name, Adelaide, reflected the grace with which she handled life, even during challenging times. Growing up surrounded by the grandeur of her heritage, she absorbed a strong sense of pride and dignity that would influence her future. Adelaide's life took an unexpected turn when, against her family's wishes, she chose to seek her fortune in the bustling streets of Paris. Focused on creating her own destiny, she took on various low-paying jobs, with each challenging task serving as a stepping stone toward her goal of independence. In those initial days, asserting her identity as a black woman in Paris and grappling with her Cameroonian accent when speaking French posed significant challenges. Every time she engaged in conversation, people would notice her not just for her French proficiency, but also because her accent resembled that of the uneducated French referred to as Le Petit Niger, or Broken French. Despite her Parisian appearance, her speech revealed her true origins. Despite linguistic obstacles, Adelaide persisted. She was committed to mastering the nuances of the French language, viewing it as a crucial tool to unlock opportunities in her adopted city. Day by day, she practiced relentlessly, refining her pronunciation and expanding her vocabulary. It was a challenging journey but with each conversation, her confidence grew. Paris, with its charming streets and diverse residents, became the place for Adelaide's Garden of Eden. The city, steeped in history and contemporary vibrancy, embraced her as she immersed herself not only in the idioms and expressions of the language, but also in the subtleties of French society. The café, teeming with a diverse clientele and lively atmosphere, provided valuable insights into understanding French social lifestyles. Adelaide learned that French people rarely extend invitations to their homes unless they trust you, their friendships often end up in cafés and restaurants. During this period, Adelaide encountered fellow immigrants and open-minded Parisians. Captivated by the culinary wonders of Paris, she aspired to create unique dishes in both French and African cuisine. The Sauvage d'Afrique restaurant, where enticing aromas filled the air, became her new classroom, a space where her love for cooking blossomed. Fate took an unexpected turn when Adelaide crossed paths with Henri Lubon, a French military officer. Their love blossomed amid the collision of two worlds, a cultural exchange that unfolded unexpectedly. Adelaide found comfort and companionship in Henri, a man whose charm and kindness captured her heart. Despite Henry's family disapproving of their union, citing Adelaide's ethnicity as unsuitable, they tied the knot. His family held the belief that La Negresse, the black lady, might have used African magic to entice him away from Elise, a woman from a noble family in the city of Tours. Elise's family owned a vineyard producing red wine sold globally, reaching even Saudi Arabia, where the royal household indulged in French wine while denying the common people this privilege. Adelaide found it difficult to endure the mockery she faced when dining with Henri Lubon's family. They often asked questions like, do you have good roads in Africa, and made assumptions about women's rights on the continent. In response to such remarks, she would assert, I haven't come to enjoy the benefits of the French. You people continue to exploit my country even today. You can also say that France asked your president to steal your money and use it to buy castles in France. We are not responsible for your poverty, Henry's elder brother said. Henri Lubon intervened. Defending Adelaide, stating, Stop embarrassing my wife, C.A. Suffet, that's enough. Adelaide is my love forever. Nobody can separate us. Tragedy struck with an unimaginable force when Henri met a ghastly end in a motor accident. 
The pain of loss was intensified by the harsh reality of life as a widow. However, unknowingly, Henri had left Adelaide a substantial legacy. His life insurance, a testament to his love and foresight, granted her financial stability in the face of adversity. With a heavy heart and newfound determination, Adelaide decided to honor Henry's memory by investing in their shared dream. Armed with six million euros from the insurance settlement, she ventured into the catering business. The restaurant she opened in the heart of Paris with a shoestring budget became a big entertainment spot in Paris, one of the legacies of her late husband, dedicated to his memory. In her forties, Mama d'Amour possessed an undeniable allure. Her mahogany skin bore the richness of her African heritage, and her eyes, deep and reflective, hinted at the stories etched within. Her hair, adorned with intricate braids, spoke of a connection to tradition even in the bustling city of Paris. Mama d'Amour carried herself with regality, a subtle echo of her royal upbringing. Her petite frame belied a strength that had weathered storms. Mama d'Amour's hands, calloused from years of hard work, carried the wisdom of a woman who had faced life's trials head-on. A radiant smile, tinged with both warmth and authority, adorned her face, making her a source of comfort for Ifioma and other African workers without papers who sought refuge in her restaurant. As a boss, Mama d'Amour blended maternal kindness with a shrewd business acumen honed through years of perseverance. She treated her staff, including Ifioma, not just as employees, but as extended family members. The restaurant became a melting pot of cultures, a personification of Mama d'Amour's ability to foster a sense of belonging. Her managerial style reflected a delicate balance between compassion and discipline. Mama d'Amour's presence commanded respect, not through force, but through the quiet strength that emanated from her. When Monsieur Guillaume de la Chaise squeezed his complimentary card into Ifioma's palm, holding her soft hand a little longer, almost as if he intended to kiss it, Mama d'Amour was furious to see them. This gesture went against the rules of the restaurant, much to the annoyance of Mama d'Amour, who was also interested in him. Guillaume was a regular customer, often dining with high society guests, except for that particular day. Without Ifioma realizing it, things started getting a bit tense at Sava d'Afrique, Taste of Africa. Mama d'Amour, the restaurant owner, was worried that Ifioma, who worked so hard for her, might be interested in the same man she fancied as a potential new husband. Mama didn't have a good opinion of African men, thinking they weren't as romantic as French men. Mama d'Amour felt proud when Guillaume, a charming Frenchman, came to her restaurant. He added a touch of class and brought in more customers. But as she noticed Ifioma and Guillaume getting closer, Mama d'Amour got uneasy. In her eyes, Guillaume was the perfect example of French charm, and she didn't want Ifioma to get too close. Mama d'Amour's feelings started to affect her behavior. She became more critical of Ifioma, maybe because deep down, she wanted to keep them apart. Little did Ifioma know that Mama d'Amour, driven by her feelings and fears, was unintentionally becoming a bit of a problem in her life. The upcoming clash of interests would bring unexpected Waala, troubles to the budding romance, testing Ifioma's strength and her connection with Guillaume. Guillaume exuded charm effortlessly. His suave demeanor and courteous manners made him a favorite among the restaurant's clientele. Beneath the polished exterior, there was an adventurous spirit, evident in his love for trying exotic dishes at Sava d'Afrique. Guillaume's wit and humor, coupled with a genuine interest in others, drew people towards him. Guillaume La Chase was a true romantic. He looked handsome with wavy brown hair and blue eyes, earning people's love with his charming demeanor. His extensive knowledge of sophisticated things, such as fine wines, added to his allure, and his perpetual smile charmed those around him. The remarkable aspect of Guillaume was his genuine appreciation for the cuisine prepared by Ifioma. He frequently expressed how much he enjoyed her service and admired her politeness, setting her apart from others. Guillaume was a sweet man, consistently showering her with compliments and generous tips, but he also had a not-so-good side. He liked to flirt with other girls at the restaurant, not just Ifioma. This sometimes made the other girls feel uncomfortable. Even though he was friendly, some of them didn't trust him completely. In this little love boat world at the restaurant, there were other people too. 
Aminata, who laughed a lot, didn't mind Guillaume's flirting and just joked around with him. Anita, a confident waitress, didn't like Guillaume's behavior and made it clear. Marie, Therese, a laid-back dishwasher, watched everything with a smile. Mama Damour, the big boss from Cameroon, also liked Guillaume. She tried to get his attention, creating some funny moments in the restaurant. Her big personality clashed with Guillaume's, making it entertaining for everyone. The restaurant became a lively place, full of laughter, a bit of jealousy, and lots of good moments. You will stop serving clients' food, Mama Damour said. What did I do, Ma? I feel Ma asked. So you are questioning my authority? No Ma, I know the clients like the way I serve them. I feel Ma, I don't like it. Can you obey simple instructions? A few weeks later, Guillaume invited Ifioma on a date to one of the expensive restaurants in Paris. In the enchanting ambience of Le Petit Cyprien, they shared a magical night. The restaurant radiated warmth, adorned with the gentle glow of candles that cast a soft light over the charming streets outside. The air was filled with the delightful aroma of French cuisine, drawing them into a world of culinary delights. The background music featured French legends, adding to the romantic atmosphere. Guillaume, with a penchant for fine dining and cultural exploration, carefully selected this place for its blend of French flavors and intimate atmosphere. As Ifioma stepped into the restaurant, an immediate spark ignited between them, setting the stage for a memorable evening. Guillaume stood up from his chair and moved forward toward the door as Ifioma appeared in her elegant Nigerian attire to usher her to their table. Good evening, my love, he greeted her. Ifioma was surprised to hear him greet her in such a tender manner. He pulled the seat backward to enable her to settle down before he moved down to his own seat facing her. Then he held her hands. Did you find your way easy to this place? he asked. Yes, sir, she replied. Call me Guillaume. No more sir when you are alone with me. Feel free with me, Ifeoma, he tried to pronounce her name, making it sound more French than Ibo. The interior of the restaurant felt like a place above her status, a spot where only wealthy French people could spend quality time. She was the only black person in the restaurant. Everybody looked at their table as if to question what an African was doing in such an exclusive place meant for the local elite, but they were more shocked that she was accompanied by a white man. The unspoken questions in their eyes betrayed their thoughts about seeing mixed couples admiring each other. However, some of the clients watched them in admiration. Guillaume overheard an older man, beside their table, talking about them. Monsieur Un Bon Gout, the man has a good taste, he told his partner who just smiled. For Ifioma, dining in such an upscale restaurant was a first-time experience. The menu presented to them with a touch of elegance, showcased a variety of exquisite dishes. From appetizers to main courses, each item was a culinary masterpiece. The cost of the wine and food added up, reaching 55 euros each, an expensive dinner for many Parisians. Guillaume, unfazed by the expense, gracefully brought out his credit card to settle the bill. The ease with which he handled the cost reflected his financial comfort, making the significant sum appear inconsequential. At that moment, as the evening unfolded in the charming restaurant, Ifioma and Guillaume began their subtle love story hidden from the sight of Mama Damour and the other ladies in the Siva d'Afrique restaurant. They shared smiles, stories, and laughter over delicious food. Ifioma's eyes lit up, and Guillaume was fascinated by her tales of cooking and her African roots. However, she was a stranger before him, he did not ask her how she got to France and why she left her country Nigeria for such an adventure. Ifioma dreaded such questions, which the French often posed to Africans upon first meeting them. But Guillaume just wanted to have a good time with her. No hassle, no pain, no worries. He was like a painter, creating a beautiful tableau for a future investment. Ifioma felt more relaxed when such dreadful and embarrassing questions did not come up during their dinner. As the night continued to unfold, Guillaume, accustomed to a lavish lifestyle, found himself increasingly drawn to Ifioma's world. The connection between them deepened, and Ifioma, feeling a sense of warmth and comfort with him, extended an invitation to continue their evening in her small room on Rue Parmentier. 
They strolled charming streets of Rue de la Republique, a black and white love story, casting its shadows on the walls of the buildings. Walking side by side, the city lights illuminating their path, Guillaume and Ifioma engaged in light-hearted jokes, their laughter resonating through the quiet streets. Guillaume was genuinely curious about Ifioma's life, her journey from Nigeria to Paris, and the challenges she faced. Ifioma, in turn, shared pieces of her story, revealing the resilience that had brought her to this moment. Arriving at Ifioma's modest dwelling, they entered a space that, though simple, held an undeniable promise of ordinary life. The room, adorned with a few personal touches, reflected Ifioma's level, just like other immigrants. The dim glow of a small lamp cast a warm ambience, creating an intimate atmosphere. Guillaume looked around, appreciating the genuine simplicity of the room. This is lovely, he remarked, genuinely interested in the African paintings hanging on the wall showing village life. Ifioma, feeling a mix of nervousness and excitement, offered him a seat on her bed. It may not be as grand as the restaurant you're used to, but it's my place, she confessed, a subtle fear in her voice. Guillaume smiled, his eyes reflecting genuine appreciation. I find this incredibly charming. It feels real, unlike the world I'm used to. Ifioma began to undress herself in front of him. Her African skirt and shirt fell to the floor, followed by her top and brassiere, revealing her pointed breasts and natural body. Amanada, one of Ifioma's co-workers who lived opposite her room, called Mama Damour to tell her that Guillaume slept with the Nigerian girl. How can this happen? The Cameroonian matriarch yelled on the phone. I saw them with my own eyes this morning, when the white man was going down the steps, Amanada assured her. She will hear from me, Mama Damour said finally. When Ifioma arrived at work the next day, Mama Damour summoned her to her office at the back of the kitchen, to question her. Initially, she was unsure about the reason for such a harsh welcome that morning, until Mama told her that she had been terminated without pay. As an undocumented immigrant, there was nothing she could do about it. Mama Damour asked her to vacate the apartment on Rue Parmentier on that very day. I told you to stay away from Guillaume, Ifioma, she said. Guillaume loves me, Ifioma replied boldly. I know my Guillaume. He will just use you and dump you. No house and no paper to live in France. Let me see how you are going to survive in this country, Mama Damour boasted. As Ifioma walked away from Mama Damour's restaurant, her heart raced with a mixture of fear and uncertainty. The weight of being fired and facing eviction pressed heavily on her shoulders. With each step, she contemplated her options, and one name echoed in her mind, Guillaume La Chase. The Frenchman who had shared enchanting moments with her in the romantic ambience of Le Petit Cyprine. Feeling a desperate need for support, Ifioma pulled out her phone and dialed Guillaume's number. Each ring seemed to amplify her anxiety, but she held on to the hope that he might offer help. After a few moments, he answered. Hello? Guillaume's voice came through the line, his tone warm and inviting. Guillaume, it's Ifioma, she said, her voice carrying a mixture of urgency and pain. Ifioma, my dear, how are you? Guillaume's concern was evident in his voice. I. I'm not good, Ifioma admitted, her words hesitant. Mama Damour fired me and she wants me out of the apartment today. There was a brief pause on the other end of the line. Guillaume processed the information, and then his voice softened. Ifioma, I'm so sorry to hear that. You don't deserve this. Tears welled up in Ifioma's eyes as she felt a combination of relief and gratitude. Guillaume, can I, can I talk to you? I don't know where to go, and I'm scared. Of course, my dear. I'm here for you. Let's meet somewhere, Guillaume suggested, his caring tone cutting through the uncertainty. I can't afford another place, Guillaume. I'm afraid I'll end up on the streets, Ifioma confessed, her vulnerability laid bare. Listen, Ifioma. You won't be on the streets. I have a spare room in my place. You can stay there until we figure things out, Guillaume offered, his sincerity evident. Ifioma's heart skipped a beat. The generosity of his offer overwhelmed her, and she struggled to find words. Guillaume, are you sure? I don't want to be a burden. You're not a burden, Ifioma. 
you're important to me. I'll be there for you, Guillaume reassured her. As she ended the call, a message lit up on her phone. It was from Ikeo Kike, reminding her not to forget their covenant. It was a blood oath, a promise to remain faithful until he joined her in Paris. The commitment she had made was now shattered. Guillaume La Chase, the French lover boy, had unexpectedly taken hold of her heart. Unable to face Ikeo Kike's inquiry, she refrained from responding to his message. Life, like an unpredictable journey, had propelled Ifeoma into the throes of a tumultuous dilemma, a labyrinth of choices that demanded sacrifices, poignant and inevitable. As she went through the confusing maze, she reached a point where she had to decide whether to move ahead and leave behind her old life and the people she loved. This decision wasn't easy, because it meant saying goodbye to familiar faces, and the promises she made to Ikeokite, the special promise they shared now felt delicate, as the unexpected attraction to someone else in a new place clouded her commitment. She felt guilty and torn inside, like a storm of emotions battling against the pledge she promised to keep. The thought of Ikeo Kike haunted her as she tried to distance herself from him, but the emotions they shared held her back like a prisoner longing for escape. Memories of the first day he made love to her and his gentleness lingered in her mind. Her newfound connection with Guillaume, the French lover boy, revealed the complex nature of sacrifices. Letting go of the familiar led to an unexpected friendship and a sense of security with a man who bridged both her worlds. In his company, especially in her chamber de bon, he made her feel cherished, like a true woman. I love him. No matter his color, Ifeoma whispered, 